Welcome back to our third part of the female reproductive series. If you missed our first and second video, go ahead and check those out. That'll get you up to speed for this video. But in the last video, we talked about ovulation, which was when the ovary released the egg. So we need to get back to this idea. Where's the egg? What's gonna happen? So let's get right in to the female reproductive series, part three. So back to the fate of the egg. Where did it go after ovulation? Well, let's use this cadaver dissection to help answer that question. Down here, you're taking a look at the anterior abdomen. Here's the pubic bone. If I reflect this away, you can see this apron-like structure here called the greater omentum. Justin did a really cool YouTube video on C-sections and talked about this structure. So go ahead and take a look at it. If I reflect, we're still not down to the uterus yet because I gotta get the small intestines out of the way here. So let me pull these out and I reflect those out and we can zoom in. You can see the uterus here, pretty amazing. To give context on its size, here's my two fingers and my thumb there. I'm touching the body of the uterus. Pretty small structure, which is amazing to think about this thing accommodating the growth of a baby or a fetus. Now remember, we're talking about what happened to the actual egg. We've got to pull up the ovary. So that structure I'm touching with my finger there, it'll come into focus. If I move it out of there, you can see the ovary. Now the ovary is where the egg came out of and it's the egg potentially ruptures into this cavity here. And yeah, they use the term rupture. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of blood with ovulation and women can experience pain during ovulation. Now the egg's just hanging out in this peritoneal cavity. That's what the name of this hollow space is that we're seeing, but we need it to get into the uterine tube. Now, a little bit of a soapbox here. We call it the uterine tube at the Institute of Human Anatomy because why would we name a female structure after some dude named Guadalupe Fallopio? Yes, I technically have to concede that fallopian tube is still an acceptable term. But if you use uterine tube, it makes a lot more sense. I mean, what are we gonna do? Like, like imagine this, let's call it the Jonathan tube. Like, it's ridiculous. So the uterine tube, if you guys can see, it's embedded in the tissue. So you have to look closely on the tip of the probe here. Here is the uterine tube and the very edge of the uterine tube kind of resembles like these little flower, little tiny petals here. The very edge of the uterine tube has these finger-like projections called fimbriae. Those are really important because when the egg ruptures out of the ovary, we don't want it to get stuck in that cavity, but these little finger-like proje projections sweep and have the sweeping motion and pull the egg into the uterine tube. Uterine tube, okay, I'm done. But this is where it actually hangs out and kind of waits. And yes, I did say hang out and wait because this is typically where fertilization occurs. These sperm cells, have to go on this treacherous journey through the vaginal canal, up through the whole body of the uterus, into the uterine tube, very treacherous, lots of work, to actually fertilize this egg that's just waiting and hanging out for them, right? So a lot of work for those sperm cells. Never mind the pain from period cramps, never mind the potential of pain from ovulation, never mind the potential of nine months of discomfort if the egg does get fertilized, those sperm cells did a lot of work. All joking aside, the egg can last inside the uterine tube for about 24 hours. Does that mean that you could only get pregnant within a 24 hour window? And the answer is no, because of those pesky little sperm cells. Sperm cells can last three to five days in the female reproductive tract. So if someone is trying to get pregnant and they have intercourse or introduce sperm cells three to four days prior to ovulation, that gives a wider window for pregnancy to occur. So remember that dominant follicle that opened up or ruptured and released the egg out of the ovary. What is to become of that follicle that opened up? Well, the follicle, remember, that released the egg because luteinizing hormone spiked. And what luteinizing hormone also does, besides causing ovulation, it causes the conversion of that follicle into another little tiny structure called the corpus luteum. So the follicle becomes the structure called the corpus luteum inside the ovary. Corpus means body, luteum means yellow. Because when they looked at these under the microscope, they looked like these little yellow bodies that were once a dominant follicle. 
This corpus luteum is really important because it secretes a high amount of progesterone. Take a look at that chart again. If you see right after ovulation, that red line for progesterone really peaks up. Yes, estrogen is released by the corpus luteum as well, but not as much as the progesterone. The progesterone is very important for continuing to build up the lining of the uterus. This makes a lot of sense when you think about, okay, we just ovulated, we might have the potential to fertilize that egg. Let's make sure the uterus is primed and ready to receive that egg to implant into the wall of the uterus that we call the endometrium. So to wrap up the whole female reproductive cycle, we have to identify two potential scenarios. One scenario, the egg does not get fertilized. The other scenario, the egg does get fertilized and we're creating a baby in this scenario. Let's start with the egg not getting fertilized. The corpus luteum, which again we mentioned secreted progesterone and estrogen, only has about a two week lifespan. And at the, as the two week wanes, progesterone and estrogen levels start to dip down dramatically. And again, you can see that from the chart. Those start to really dip down towards day 28. If that continues to occur, then it kind of signals to the body, we're ready to try this again because the egg did not get fertilized. So progesterone, estrogen levels going down, jumps into the next cycle, and the pituitary gland responds by giving another little cycle of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Again, that's when it starts over, a period starts. Those dips in progesterone and estrogen are essentially kind of blamed for PMS or the symptoms that come with PMS or the mood changes or the mood swings because hormones are pretty powerful things that can affect mood and behavior and things of that nature. But let's go to the other scenario. What happens if the egg is fertilized? The sperm cell uniting with the egg creates fertilization in what we call an embryo. An embryo releases a very important hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. Many of you have probably heard of this is because this is what is detected in home pregnancy tests because this hormone can be secreted in the urine and that's what the home pregnancy test will detect. You can also do a blood test because it's circulating throughout the blood as well. But this hormone has a really important function. Remember, the corpus luteum only had a two week lifespan to keep progesterone and estrogen levels up. And what this hormone does is sustains the corpus luteum. It keeps the corpus luteum, you could almost think of it as alive, up to 13 to 20 weeks into pregnancy. So think about the importance of that. If progesterone and estrogen levels stay high, a period is not going to start, or in other words, the cycle is not going to restart. So that's what HCG's, why it's so important initially is to make sure the corpus luteum is sustained. Therefore, estrogen and progesterone is going to be sustained and no period is going to start. You do not want a period to start if you're trying to implant an embryo into the inside lining of the uterus because that would slough off the embryo and not allow it to implant and then start to develop a placenta and to start the process of pregnancy. And one last thing on that corpus luteum. You heard me mention that it can last 13 to 20 weeks into pregnancy because of HC HCG sustaining it. After that time period, you don't need it because once you get into the weeks of 13 to 20, the placenta is large enough and the placenta is secreting a whole bunch of progesterone and estrogen on its own. And so the corpus luteum essentially becomes unnecessary. Wow, that covers another female reproductive video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that and that gave you some more of a clear understanding of fertilization takes place or fertilization does not take place. Again, if you're new to us, please subscribe, like, comment below, give us some questions, uh, suggestions on content that you guys like to see. In our next video, we're gonna wrap all this up into a nice little package and even have a little bit of a bonus at the end where we talk about the differences between men and women as far as hormone levels. So that should be interesting. And if you choose to participate in fertilization between now and our next video, please do so responsibly.